Hi, Camille. Thank you so much for joining me for Lead Time Chats. Yes, thank you for having me. All right, so today we're going to talk about boring stuff, uh, specifically boring tech and boring plans. And Camille, I know you've written about both of these and are a huge advocate for both. So maybe to start us off, uh, what do you mean by boring tech and boring plans? So, I mean, boring tech, you know, is uh, obviously a line stolen from uh, my friend Dan McKinley, McFunley, who has an amazing blog post and talk on this topic where, you know, he, he talks about how when you're, when you're at a company, you have to choose what you invest in and you, can't, you have this notion of innovation tokens that you can spend, yes. right? You know, and so it, when you're, especially when you're at a startup and you're trying to figure out like, what, are, what am I building? And I've got all these product ideas. You know, your innovation tokens, your creativity should really be mostly focused on being creative in the product that you're building that you to make your business succeed, right? Um, and you probably don't want to spend all of your innovation tokens on cool tech stuff like, you know, the newest cool programming language or, you know, some, you know, alpha release database or whatever, right? Or redefining um, management, those sorts of things. Redefining <laughs> management, uh, you know, lots of things you can spend innovation tokens on. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, it seems like it's not going to be, you know, it, it seems like a fun thing and maybe it won't be that expensive. And, you know, in reality, a lot of times these things are just a big distraction from the core business of like making your company successful. Um, and so, you know, and I am generally speaking a, a, a believer in, in that. Now, I do run a platform engineering team, um, which means that I do have to eventually uh, wrangle interesting tech or else, frankly, my, my company and my team will fall behind. Right. So, you know, at some point, you know, things go from bleeding edge, as it were, you know, super new and they get a little bit more established. And even though they're still kind of early ish stage, you can clearly see that, oh, yeah, this is a valuable thing. This is mm -hmm. something that like there is a clear reason why this technology was developed. And we probably should be thinking about taking advantage of that right now. But the cloud would have been an example of this a long time ago. Um, but, you know, these days it's even still things like, you know, Kubernetes, Envoy, um, you know, new, new patterns in, you know, uh, messaging perhaps, right? Uh, you know, at least again, like all the things I'm saying are not exactly that cutting edge, you know, they're, they're certainly not anything that, you know, someone doing something crazy greenfield, cool tech idea would look at and be like, oh, that's, that's what she thinks about as cutting edge, but they're still, you know, definitely not like the incumbent majority where everyone knows them, right? I think, right. you know, lots of people are, are running things on top of Kubernetes, but I would bet you that most developers are still not really that familiar with it, you know, mm -hmm. far less so systems like Envoy, right? Um, you know, you've got some people that know how to how to wrangle Kafka, for example, but a lot of people are still just like scratching the surface of a technology like that. And then, you know, you've got Lambda, you've got all the kind of cloud technologies that are very cool. And also, you know, you've got to figure out how to, how to use them, how to adopt them, how to make them useful. Um, so I think that, but I think that it's important for platform teams eventually do need to adopt these probably a little bit earlier um, than you might when you're at a startup really thinking about your boring technology, right? So I, I'm at a bigger company now, not a big company, but a more established company, right? You know, a few hundred engineers. Um, and, you know, we do have big demands on our technology. We really do need to think about scaling things very large. We need to think about storing petabytes of data and, you know, processing, you know, you processing bandwidths of half a million cores, right? So like, these are actually like pretty significant problems. And if you aren't, you know, keeping up with the, uh, you know, advancements and things like Kubernetes to, to a reasonable degree, you are going to start falling behind when it comes to trying to scale to environments like that. Mm -hmm. so that kind of brings you to the boring plans side of this. Um, because the platform team in a company like this uh, is the team that ultimately needs to get that slightly more interesting technology in the door. And the reason you have to do this is because if you don't do it, some product team is going to 
say you're not providing me what I need and they're going to bring it in themselves and that's even worse. So <laughs> some, you know, so you've got to do, you've got to be at least ahead of the product teams so that they don't create a horrible mess of shadow infrastructure that you then have to take over and fix. That's, that's like very painful. Mm -hmm. uh, but you owe it to yourselves when you're bringing in this slightly more interesting technology to move the boring angle from the technology to the planning that it's important for you to actually be very thoughtful. You're not just gonna throw Kubernetes out there and all of a sudden you've got you know, 25,000 machines orchestrated by Kubernetes and it's great and everybody's happy. Like, no, actually you really need to think about, okay, I've got this new foundational platform technology. I've got this new storage system. I've got this new approach to security. Mm -hmm. I not only need to like build it or integrate it make it work for my environment, I need to think about how I'm going to migrate everyone over time to be using this in such a way that it feels um, good for them and not like a punishment that they're just being forced to adopt the newest thing that the platform team thinks is fun. Mm -hmm. So kind of embracing this predictability, stability in the, in the rolling out of, of the more interesting technology. Yeah, and then just thinking about the, you know, thinking about the fact that like there's a lot of interesting details, especially at scale, in making these kinds of big platform systems work. Um, but you really don't want your users and your customers, the other people that rely on your platforms, be bearing the brunt of that interesting stuff because it's causing them a lot of pain and grief in terms of breaking their systems or being confusing for them, you know, just like, how do I use this? This doesn't work for me. What do I need to do? Because your team kind of thoughtlessly approached the problem and said, well, we're just gonna, you know, do this upgrade, flip a switch, and then everyone will be using the new thing without thinking about the implications for all of those people who have to use the new thing and, you know, what their experience is going to be like. What is that, um, I guess, more tactically or more concretely, what does that look like for to have a boring plan to roll something out? So, I mean, it, it, first of all, it looks like a plan at all. It looks like a plan that, that recognizes the fact of like the migration part of this work that, that you know, it looks like a plan that isn't just the technical implementation. So I think that's like table stakes, right? If your plan, a lot of people don't have a plan at all. So let's 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 be honest. Like engineers are not great at planning. I'm not great at planning, but we all have to do it at some point. Um, but a lot of times, like you get a you get a plan for a system, and it's like here's all the cool technical stuff that we need to do to build this. And it's like, great. That is that's a good baseline. But you have not addressed what we do once we have something that we think is working, right? And so, you know, a boring plan is going to have a lot of that technical stuff. It's going to recognize the systems that you need to integrate with. It's going to recognize how do we, how do we get assurance that this thing can scale? It's going to recognize, um, you know, security and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. But then it's also going to recognize that, like, even once we get to something we think is working, we now need to talk to people. We need to have target alpha users, people that are going to use this thing um, that, you know, we think there's some advantage to them using it or they're just like friendly, friendly customers um, that are going to give us feedback about like what's good about this and what's bad about this, right? We're going to have clear targets for, you know, what does, what does going from alpha to beta look like, right? At least in, in my teams, my expectation is that like, you're not really changing features, at least for V1, once you get to beta, right? Beta is like your feature complete and now you're nailing down the operability, you're nailing down the scaling, you're, you know, you, you have something that you're like, all right, this works for at least our first set of use cases and our first set of customers. You may be slowly starting to onboard some people, um, but beta is all about getting to the operability um, and uh, supportability that you can then go to GA and say like, now this is really supported. This is really supported for critical applications. And again, even then when you've gone to GA, you may still need to be doing active outreach to say who needs to be moving on to this, right? All right, we've got the first tranche of people moved, but there's, you know, we actually really wanna get rid of the old system. So by the way, like it's often you're building a new system, not just for something completely new, 
but you're actually looking to replace some old way of doing things. You want to move people off of OpenStack and VMs onto a Kubernetes-based system. Well, you can't just say, all right, you know, Kubernetes is here and it's great and we support it and it's super available and everything is awesome. Move your stuff. You're actually going to have to then say, okay, what do we, again, who are the, who are the people that are lagging by that haven't moved off the old mm -hmm. system? Are we missing features that we now need to add to our GA product to get the laggards behind? Do we need to sit with them and understand their concerns, right? Do we have a full offering that we feel confident can meet all of the use cases we need to meet so that we then can really go through the, mic, the final dregs of the migration where you really are saying, we've given you all the carrots, we've given you all the time in the world, now we're gonna, now you gotta move. We're turning the old system off, you gotta do that migration, no more yeah. excuses. It sounds like really bringing the same lens of how much rigor and planning you would put into an external launch to an internal platform launch, you know, the alpha, the beta, the general availability and, you know, getting the feedback and making sure you have the alpha and beta customers, all that, all that good stuff. Um, yes, having been on teams where high level strategy seems to change constantly and you're <laughs> never quite sure if it's going to change next week or the week after that, um, boring, boring plans does sound pretty good. Uh, what what challenges have you faced in, in trying to build and advocate for a culture of predictability and stability? I mean, look, I do think that it's, it's work and it's work that people are not necessarily comfortable with. You know, mm -hmm. um, the first time you have to, you know, think through and kind of own a long running plan like this, it's not, it's not necessarily fun. Right. You know, you're like, oh, like I loved the part of this where I was learning about this new system. And I hate the part of this where I'm, you know, I feel like I'm I'm just having to chase down the next bug, the next small thing. I'm having to chase down the next person who hasn't updated, like whatever, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that some of the challenge really is, you know, in that, especially, I mean. It's not as bad when you're at a more established company, I think, because you have you tend to have more mix of skills in your workforce, right? But I think probably at startups, right? You startups favor hiring people who want to just like get, you know, move fast. I want to do greenfield stuff. I want to think about the next thing. I'm really, you know, I'm excited yeah. about the new stuff. And so you you have people that just like really don't want to do that, right? At least yeah. at a more established company, you may have a mix. And you know, the certainly one of the approaches I recommend is like, look, recognize that you have a mix and that some people might be more appropriate for the earlier stages. You just have to make sure that you can reward people who do the long, you know, the long drawn out. Yes. <laughs> right. Cause I think yeah. that's, you know, this stuff often falls down when you have a culture that only rewards, oh, I did, I did the alpha launch of this. And then I did the alpha launch of that. And I did the alpha launch of the other thing. You know, the alpha it, you know, takes 20% yeah. of the time as opposed to getting all the way to GA. And so you do have to be yeah. thoughtful culturally about like not over rewarding the people who only do the, the new stuff and you know, forgetting about uh, the people who actually do the tedious work to finish it because then you just end up with like a graveyard of you know, alpha beta right. products that, that have never quite gone to GA because nobody, everybody sees the writing on the wall. I'm not gonna get promoted. For doing this like tedious piled part. on top of each other it's yeah. yeah i've heard the um that makes me think of uh i don't remember what post this was but the idea of like pioneers settlers and town planners and you may have people uh -huh. who are more a better fit for pioneering or settling or town planning um but what's important is that you you know you incentivize and reward all of them so that you don't end up with the the zero to one people the ones who are spinning it up for the first time getting all the all the um reward for that absolutely and i do think also that like you know we underestimate how much you do need to teach people how to do that those last bits of of you know how do you actually run something that goes on this long like Everybody, not, maybe not everybody, but most people, whether you go through coding academy or college or whatever your path into being a software engineer is, you've done short projects. You've done <laughs> even semester long projects, but there's still, that's a short project. You've done internships, you've done, you've done stuff that just, you know, 
had a beginning and an end, and you could see the other side of it in the period of three months or so. Right. Most of us, it, after you know getting into the workforce the first time, have never done anything that's 12 months, 18 months, three years. Like, you know, <laughs> frankly, like you may have never, you know, a lot of people have just never experienced that. So how do you yeah. teach people what it means to do that work? And then I think the final thing is, and this is something that like I pushed a lot in my in my org is how do you make that that last those last long kind of migration pieces as easy as possible so that it doesn't require a bunch of manual project management to do it. And this does require like a bit of scaffolding in your environment in terms of like you have to you have to know what systems are running where you have to know who owns what code bases and what services and you know who the manager of that person is if they ignore you but if you have uh if you have actually a setup of understanding ownership of systems understanding you know locations of running software you can put quite decent automation in place to help to sort of manage the workflow of actually telling people again that those dregs in the projects where it's like who okay like who are the last 10 percent of laggards who just haven't done it and we we need to get this done and we've gotten the buy-in that we're going to get this finished this year so we can shut this old system down you know instead of having a project manager that has to run around with a clipboard or worse an engineer who has to act like a project manager running around with the clipboard can you do can you automate that to at least make the identification of those people easier you know, make it a little bit easier to remind them, have dashboards of who's done what, right? Um, yeah. And I think that's actually, I, I, I feel lucky that, you know, that's something that my team, we all, we invested in a couple of years ago. So, you know, we didn't have this for a while. And, um, you know, one of, one of the proudest things I've done, to be quite honest, in, in my current job is challenging my team when they said, I think we really need a project manager to see this through. And I was like, do you really? Or like, can't like, do we have all the information about who owns what and what's running where and what's in what version? Can we think about a way to instead like make this change management oversight, you know, mostly automated mm -hmm. and with thoughtfully, right? You don't want to spam people with Jira tickets. So you've got to be thoughtful right. about, you know, how you do it. But like, can we make this so that the project management aspect of it is very rarely painful so that I don't have to have a full-time project manager running around and calling a bunch of meetings and, you know, just sort of manually tracking all the stuff that actually like very little of that will need to be done. And you can escalate to me if people are really not, you know, not listening to you when you say, when, when, when you say, Hey, you've got to finish this and close it off by the end of the year. Um, and that has worked out really well for us. And I think we're in a lucky position um, to have that, but it is, you know, I also just like super excited with how well that turned out. Cause when I proposed that I wasn't <laughs> sure, how, you know, I was like, oh, this may not be possible and I may just need to hire a PM. And Throw project. it out there. You know, but like, you know, it's cool when when you kind of challenge people to say, look, we're engineers, we automate things. We, you know, I'm not a fan of like all of like defaulting to use technology for people problems, but like sometimes, you know, it's not exactly a people problem, it's a process problem. Right. And actually technology can be pretty good for a process problem. And automation is not an option to a lot of people, right, who are not engineers. And so there may be some thinking outside the box that is not like general best practices. Yeah. Um, all right. So for people who are listening and they're like, yes, I'm bought in on boring plans. Um, I don't want to, you know, it doesn't have to be this like chaotic um, struggle but they may feel, I guess for some startups, there's kind of this culture where people, maybe the founders or just some startup people pride themselves on being able to function in an environment of sort of like chaos and, and constant change. And they may even really try to fuel that sort of environment to create urgency or motivation. Um, so for people who do want to be you know, who want to have boring plans, but feel like this constant change is coming maybe from above them, from executives or higher ups. Do you have any tactical advice for how to navigate that for themselves and for their teams? So, I mean, I think it, 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 it definitely depends on like 
how much control and autonomy you can you can have and the kind of environment, right? So like, um, you know, again, as we said, we were saying earlier, you choose boring tech as a startup because boring tech actually means you probably need to do less of this boring planet, right? You're using pretty mm. standard stuff. It's well known. You're not, hopefully you're not picking something that's changing so fast that you constantly have to be upgrading and then navigating all these upgrades and like, and, and like dealing with that. And so like, I, I do think this doesn't answer the question, but like, you know, I really would advise you if you're in a, if you're in a startup environment where the idea of being able to make boring plans seems impossible, then you should favor not making choices that require boring plans, frankly, right? Like just do everything you can to really limit the places where you think, the, you know, I want to use this new thing, but it's going to be a major upgrade. Maybe now is not the time for you to, to invest in that. Um, then I, I also think that um, I also think that for any like long running technical project at a startup where you also have lots of demands coming in from above, I mean I think there's you know there's a lot of like leadership savvy in you have to manage up very well. So if you're gonna do something big and long running, you've got to express the impact of it. You've got to be able to articulate why it's valuable, and many engineers do not know how to do. Why is it important for us to move from Postgres to Spanner? Like, well, Spanner is kind of cool. And like, we might occasionally like really want like global consistency. And so we should just do it. That is not a compelling story. And here's the tech spec for how to do it. <laughs> yes. Like you have got to get really good at talking about things that matter to your senior management whether it's engineering velocity, right? We are slow, we are, we are going slow because we are constantly fighting fires in this system and we will not be able to speed up until the system is more stable. Um, you know, whether it is cost sometimes, rarely, but it might be cost, right? You know, we are just bleeding money because we're using, you know, this very expensive cloud thing for everything. And we actually just think we could like use this less expensive cloud thing and it'll make our lives much easier. Probably you shouldn't be doing that if you're a startup, but like maybe, right? maybe, maybe that's a, maybe that's a thing. Um, you know, so I, I do think that like you gotta speak to the impact that they are going to care about. Mm -hmm. And then you've also got to figure out how to deliver value incrementally during the process as if you can, right? So like, you know, again, you're doing something that needs to be long running. You're doing it for a reason. It's going to provide some value. What is a high profile use case, high profile new product feature, high profile system that needs to scale, high profile data processing, whatever, right? That is like really struggling that you're like, we're gonna do the alpha version of this with that team or for this thing. And we're gonna do the alpha version and then we're gonna launch that. And we're gonna show how awesome this is. And that is going to be part of the way we get the credibility and coverage to do this long running project because we are not just saying we're going to deliver value in two years. We're delivering value, you know, much sooner than that. Right. So rather than it being possible at the very end, having that incremental progress and milestones. Yeah. Great. Well, um, Camille, thank you so much for joining me. I think this will be very helpful for people who are also maybe looking for uh, some inspiration for boring plans. Absolutely. Uh, yes, thank you for having me.